Listen in for insights into the dynamic world of social media and influencer marketing with a true industry leader. She's navigated the shifting tides of the digital era from Facebook's reign to TikTok's rise and emerged as a trailblazer in influencer marketing. Meet the brilliant Sedge Beswick. She's been the strategist for powerhouses like Red Bull and ASOS and established her own award-winning influencer marketing agency, Scene Connects, scaled it to an incredible 24 million pound valuation. Beyond her business acumen, Sedge is paving the way for future marketers through a mentorship program that she's initiated and has helped over 50 young minds break into the industry. Today, we dive into her journey, exploring all of the different facets of how she constructed her empire, the insights that have fueled her success and her quest for work-life balance in a field that's always in flux and is always on. Prepare yourself for a captivating conversation with the remarkable Sedge Beswick. Let's get into it. Sedge, thank you so much for being on the Brand Gravity Show. I'm thrilled to geek out with you about all things business building, brand building. I would love to start. Scene Connects has an incredible valuation of 24 million pounds, according to my notes. Tell us a little bit about the growth. How, how's the journey been? I mean, it's been a roller coaster. I don't know any business owner that wouldn't tell you that it has been an absolute ride. Uh, but we have been trading for seven years as of next week, actually, and started super small in a room with literally no windows and one employee and have just kind of gone with the flow. I very much kind of lead off gut and intuition, moved with the market. We are in quite a fast paced area as most of the guests that you speak to have on the show. And so, yeah, just rolling with the punches, riding out the various different crazy scenarios that come with running a business and just seeing where things go. I love that. Can you think of a especially crazy like catalyst moment or pivot moment where you didn't know if you were going to be able to keep growing and how it turned out. I would love to hear this. Yeah, story. a really good one is actually one of our first clients was as a 1.7 mil retainer. So it was a big client on paper. It looked very sexy. It was a really well-known brand. The team were really excited to work on the business, but it was I've never had sleepless nights like having that client because they were a credit based business and it basically meant our payment terms were 90 days and we would pay the influencers or the photographers, videographers on a 30 day payment term. And on average, they'd pay us on about 120 days. So all of a sudden I had to learn everything about cash flow <laughs> and I would be in all my board meetings and I'd be like, well, this business is doing really well. And like, this is the size of the client we're getting. And these are household brands and big celebrity names. And isn't this brilliant? And they'd be like, there's no money in the bank. And it was this constant kind of every single day fear of like, will we actually be able to pay the third parties that we're working with? Will we get out of this cycle? And we actually worked with that client for three years and they are, amazing and they are the they've all moved to different places and different businesses and I still keep in touch with them now and some of them I've just recently started working with again but losing that client in terms of like the mental load of running an agency was one of the best things that has actually ever happened and so yeah that was that had the fear and the sleepless nights and the anxiety and everything in between and that was quite early on in our journey too trial by fire my goodness yeah I'd love to zoom in a little bit so you've been in this social media influencer world for a while now what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen I mean right now I feel like it is quite a crazy time in this space with threads launching and the dominance because obviously the association to Facebook and Instagram and then I've seen literally nothing overly exciting from threads after launch day and then you've got like Elon Musk in a panic and he's rebranding things to X and just you know destroying the share price but I think the biggest pivotal pivotal moment for me was probably at the start of the pandemic 
and trying to get all of our brands that we work with onto TikTok and explaining that the way in which people consume their content is very much through entertainment first. And they're looking, your audience are looking for escapism and this like lighthearted, lo-fi content that could be someone's granddad or it could be your traditional influencer. Like this is the space to be in. There was such a nervousness from every single brand that we worked with. And obviously then six months later, it's like, well, why on earth are we not on TikTok? Get us on TikTok immediately. And you're like, "Mm, just going to tell you about this thing I emailed you months ago. Uh, (laughs) And so, and I do think we've met that, kind of change social media, social media and the way we use social still, to, it hasn't gone back to where it was. It was very much like, how do you entertain and steal the attention from your audience, especially when they're dual screening or connected TV or whatever it might be. It's all like, how can you really kind of steal the attention of your audience? Yes. Because you have this unique perspective, If people are trying to build a personal brand, they're trying to build their own influence, what have you seen worked really well for the most successful influencers that you worked with? The most successful thing and the most interesting thing that you can do to stand out, especially now, like this is a very oversaturated market. There are a lot of people, whether you run a business, whether you are into fashion, whether you're beauty, there's like hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people doing something similar so really sticking to who you are as a personal person and you spoke about that being your personal brand we live in a copycat society where you see something work for someone else you're like oh that's easy i'll just do the same thing you have to own your own usp and really stick to it and so over here we have you know, Amelia from Chicken Shop doing something completely different. You've got Mrs. Hinch, who is a cleaning influencer. You've got Bolzol, who is a finance influencer. Like, work out what it is that you are driven by, passionate passionate about, and really own that territory. And do not almost look at any competitor. Just really carve out your own niche. Yeah, such great advice. And one that I like to share as often as possible. So so thank you for also reiterating (laughs) it. I did that exact thing when I started my business. I was looking at you know, all of the successful course creators, educators online. I'm like, oh, I need to be like that. I need to be like that person. And it was an absolute disaster as you can probably imagine. It's so so easy to do though, right? When you're just getting started is the hardest bit. So then you do Mm. a bit of market research and you look at what's performing and what's working. You're like, oh, I could do that. But then you slowly realize that it's being done and there's a reason why there is still a gap in the market for you. And there's a gap in the market for everyone, but you, you have to be you. Yes, 100%. And then on the flip side, you guys have worked with amazing household brands, Nike, eBay, Panasonic, the list goes on. Do you have a favorite campaign story that you can share? I thought you were going to say a favorite brand there. I was like, you can't ask me that. It's like children. (laughs) My favorite campaign. I also like children, to be fair, but... (laughs) Well, I have one, stands. so I have one favorite okay. child. <laughs> My favorite campaign is probably, oh God, I wish I'd thought about this in advance because I have like a million thrown around my head. I really loved the work we've recently done with eBay. So every American wants to talk to me about Love Island. Americans have especially in my New York office, any status call, it's like Love Island, high on top of the agenda. And Love Island had a really close synergy with fast fashion because of the nature of the program. You see, you know, men and women every single day wearing different looks. And previously they would be associated to fast fashion brands. And we received a brief from eBay, which is they were about to be the headline sponsor for Love Island. But with eBay, there are only a number of items per SKU because it is secondhand, it is pre-love fashion. And it was a real, really amazing opportunity to change the narrative throughout, which was, you know, changing the mindset of Gen Z and fast fashion and buy where it wants, throw it away to really understanding and looking after and nurturing your clothes and thinking of the different ways that you could really cherish those items, but also see value in them when you've had enough of them. So that buyer seller market and the work we did and we did this one was with a few different agencies. There was a media partner. There was obviously the partnership with ITV, but the choosing of the who to bring that narrative to life and working with Tash from two seasons ago now, actually, she was there's so much synergy and so much alignment. And then also partnering with her stylist. It just was one of those campaigns where we went, this made a lot of sense. 
And I mm. find myself quite often like opening social channels or reading different platforms like the drum. And I'm like, oh God, I wish we'd worked on that. Or if we'd had that brief, this is how it have made it like bigger or better or kind of been a, had a bit more synergy to the customer. And that is one of the campaigns where I have people, you know, we were just in Cannes and people are like, oh my God, the Love Island bit that you did, that was amazing. And so I take a lot of pride in what the team did on that campaign. Mm, absolutely brilliant. Can you shed some light into the strategic process behind planning all of that? How did you arrive at some of those key insights that you used then? Yeah, so I, with this campaign in particular, so any campaign that we work on, how we get to that is always very different because the brief is very different. The brand is very different. And some brands are absolute experts in this space, but they just don't have the capacity internally. And then we have other brands that are very much like, whoa, what do we do? And can you take us on the journey? So with the Tash and eBay alignment, you're, you immediately have the people that are on the show. So then it was around social listening and auditing and reviewing who was actually an ambassador and a spokesperson within the pre-love space previously. Because if we were going to go down a route of someone who's spoken about fast fashion and only wore fast fashion, immediately that looks like a pay to pay play space. Mm -hmm. And from a customer perspective, they would never believe in it. It would never have landed. It would not have got the coverage that it had previously. Whereas Tash was a big advocate of pre-loved, was a big user of eBay. And then we had our eyes and ears and the villa where when you were bringing in the rail each day, she was so excited by the product that was coming in. And there were other contestants who had bigger followings at the time or, you know, would have been able to really bring to life the product in a different way from a style perspective. But when the rail came in, they were defaulting to fast fashion. They were defaulting to I'll just wear something I brought in myself. And so, again, the the understanding of the platform, the understanding of pre-loved and the synergy there was hugely, hugely important to make sure we got that message right. Absolutely fascinating. I am hearing a lot about authenticity and finding alignment between the campaign message, the influencer and the brand to have that success. I love all of that. You mentioned that you have built your business using intuition when you first were telling this story. Do you have an example of where you ignored logic perhaps and just leaned into yeah. intuition? I think a really good example, and I'm trying to choose my words in my head here because it's one I could get in trouble with. Right. But we <laughs> recently just, well, not recently now, about 18 months ago, went through a process and that process was to go through to the next stage of investment for the business. So we went through, we chose an advisor, we went through speed dating, or no, not speed dating, because it's hours upon hours of meetings, and made our shortlist of potential investors. And we were going through that process, and I found out I was pregnant. And so that throws a spanner in the works when you are the founder of an agency, there is no other co-founder, it is, the board is me and my current investors. And so we, I decided at week 12, which is when you basically can more openly talk about the fact you're pregnant to be really honest and tell them that I was pregnant. And understandably, there was a lot of nervousness around what that meant for the future of the business. They didn't know how long I was going to take out of the business. They didn't know how involved I was or wasn't in the business at that time. And the process immediately had gone from being like super hyped, really excited this is amazing, this is great, to being really drawn out and slow and painful. At that point, I've never gone through a process of selling an agency or any business previously. And so I spent a lot of time getting the views and the opinions of other people that have Mm. been here, done that, got the t-shirt, got it signed. And all of that feedback and all of that insight was hugely, hugely important to the decision that I decided to make. But ultimately, that was the decision that I had to make. And I had this kind of big alarm bell in my brain that was like, this just does not feel right. And the weeks that turned into months of the process, like the process lasted over a year when it should have been closed and dealt with many, many months before that. And we were about six weeks before my due date. And I was like, I don't think I can do this. And the reasons why I couldn't do it was because I didn't know what it was like to work with that partner cheek to jowl and it felt brutally unfair for me to then go on maternity irrespective of how long I was going to go on maternity and let my senior team 
be on the firing line to work on what that working relationship would be. And as soon as I said, thank you very much, we're going to put this on ice for a minute, then everything happened so quickly. And there was this huge part of me that was like, oh, wow, this is actually going to happen. And they really do want this agency and they do really want to be part of, you know, the journey of what's next for this business. And then there was another part of me that thought, thought, Jesus Christ, you could have done this at any point. (laughs) And you chose to not make it happen quickly. And every single day as you're getting closer to a due date, I was like, there is a hard finish here. It's not like I can just keep going and keep going. Like, a human being will be here. And I was having sleepless nights anyway, right? Because you're pregnant, heartburn, exhausted, uncomfortable. And I just kind of in my head had this vision that I was going to be in a labor ward (laughs) signing papers. And I was like, I can't, I just can't. And it was a Saturday. I actually couldn't get hold of the main person. And I got hold of his number two and I walked through my rationale and he was like, you've really, really made your decision here. And I was like, I have, and it is also my decision. So please don't try and influence. Please don't give me, a, you know, another rationale or more to think about. My gut is telling me this is absolutely not the right time. And he really respected that, which I also really appreciate because again, in that scenario, you get so much advice and so many different views and opinions. I got called a silly girl when I pulled out the process and it's just almost now comical the things and the steps that you go through which is why I'm a firm believer of intuition yes yes I have some clients right now that are in that process of taking on investment do you have any words of wisdom for any entrepreneurs that are doing that well I didn't complete so they might want someone who has completed (laughs) the deal first and foremost but what I there's a lot of things and I learned a hell of a lot and I am truly grateful for that But I, when I am ready to go through that process again, my thing would be to not be intimidated by the people in the room and it is their job and it is your advisor's job to stop using jargon and acronyms. They, you know, this deal lived and died ultimately by me and that was my decision and I was often forgotten about in that process and I was often overwhelmed and I was on my phone Googling what half of the things meant. And I really wish quite early on, I'd kind of said, okay, we're all human. I get that you do this all day, every day, but this, you know, stop being an ass <laughs> in the most simple form. And I think yeah. the second thing is to go into that process really knowing what you want. And I knew what I wanted, but I didn't, and I knew what I wanted for me, for my family, for the business, for my team but I didn't have the confidence to hold straight with that. And I actually recently spoke to an incredible, incredible human being who has been through two private equity investments. And he was like, when I started my second investment, I said to them, if you chip me a penny on my price, I'm pulling out in seconds. So don't even come to me with a chip because I will never speak to you again. And he was like, and I genuinely think that's the only reason why they didn't chip the price is I went Mm -hmm. in with my three things that I would not barter on, I told them straight out, this is, these are the facts and this is what you get on board with, take it or leave it. And I definitely didn't go in or have that confidence in the process because I felt like I was the novice and I was the one learning constantly on the go. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard when it's the first time. And thankfully now you'll have the, the 2020 hindsight, if you ever decide to do that process again, thank you so much for sharing, sharing that it's very needed for for people to hear, I think. What would you tell your younger self that was just starting your business? What advice would you give her? Ooh, what would I give her? I would I would tell her to find balance sooner. And and I've always been a bit of a workaholic. I've always loved working and I take so much joy from it, but that then meant that I was always the person working last on my emails and at my laptop and at my desk when I didn't necessarily need to be. And I definitely think I'm of the generation and definitely the businesses that I've worked at, that was definitely encouraged and rewarded. And as a result, I would often glorify, oh, I've been away for a weekend and I've got a thousand emails. Oh, you know, I've just spent 14, 15 hours working. And I think the glorification of overworking is such an incredibly horrendous habit. And it's still something that I have to unpick now. And I have had my daughter. She's now nine months. She is ace and she is healthy and she's brilliant. 
And that's the first time ever in my, I'm 34 and I've been working since I was 15, 16. And I was like, oh, something has to give here. And trying to unpick a lifetime of those bad habits and making sure I, I work eight till four so that I can have two and a half hours with her before bedtime starts. And that's my time with her every single day. And if I want to work all through the night, that's my prerogative. But changing and reworking what balance is and what balance looks like for me has been really hard to do. Mm. Was it becoming a mother that was that catalyst that really oh, made the change? 100%. 100%. Same for me. <laughs> because you can, you can easily sit at your desk, right? And then you're like, so my, my theory, and I'd love to know yours, was if you're taking time away from me being with my daughter, it has to have incremental value to her somehow in the long run. Mm. So if I'm then doing something so irrelevant that it is not good use of my time, but there's someone better than me in the team, like let them do that and let me be mom for my two and a half hours a day because I mean, I don't know how old your kids are, but it just goes so quickly and it's it terrifying. Does. It is absolutely terrifying. Mine are 10 and seven. So I can tell you from the stage that it happens like that. It is so fast. And frankly, like I really like my kids and I like spending time with them and just having that other part of life was really helpful for me and my business. Cause I was the same way. It, yeah. 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 And you're going on a holiday in August. So you're clearly am. walking your talk now. All new. This whole new me. <laughs> Amazing. I'd love to finish up with a little bit more of a deep dive into this influencer industry. I feel like it's such a black box. Like a lot of us don't really understand how it works. What in terms of practicality, how are you seeing influencers grow? And I know that you're working with them probably after they've reached some level of success, but what has, what have you seen that has worked really well to increase influence? I'm going to flip that question slightly on its head, Perfect. but I think the thing that is the most interesting evolution within this space right now is that previously when people were of influence it was very much around obviously having their content plan and talking about what made them unique and got them a loyal fan base and the biggest shift for me is now not about how many platforms can you be on and how much can you grow your audience and grow your followership but the successful influencers are really thinking about themselves as businesses and they're mm. thinking about the different revenue streams that, yes, there is the commercial brand partnerships that might come through being on TikTok or the ad spend on YouTube. But it's actually like, do I want to have my own business or do I want to get paid to do speaker profile gigs? Do I want to have my own consultancy? Do I want to have my own filters that people can purchase so that I'm making their life easier with their kind of ambitions to be a content creator? And it's I don't believe it's enough anymore to produce and to create content and to distribute it across your lead platform. I think you have to be far savvier and to have that business acumen because that then gets instilled in through every single touch point that you have as a person with a personal brand. And we've seen this with the celebrity influencers. It's been amazing and really impressive. I mean, I'm thinking of the Kardashians because I'm... You can't not, right? <laughs> you can't not. You, you can't yeah. not. Like Credit where credit is due. And I used to read... I've never actually watched the Kardashians, the show. Okay. I felt like it was a huge success in my life that I've never even stumbled past a TV with it on. And then I am like Skims' biggest diehard fan. And the domino Same. effect is that I just think Kim Kardashian is the best business entrepreneur going because she created something unique. The price point is absolutely bang on. The way she markets the brand, and I get it's easier because she's got the money and she's got, you know, Emma in her team and backing her corner. But like, again, credit where credit is due. Like that is, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just wild. For businesses that are thinking about working with influencers, what does having an agency like yours help them do? Yeah, so a lot of things. But it would be, it depends on the scale of the organization. It depends on your budget. But for us, what we would always help with is the creative concept, first and foremost, and making sure when it is then distributed across the social platforms, it doesn't feel like an ad. It doesn't feel like a badging exercise. You're like, this could live in a million and one other places because it is so damn good. 
And we are experts, obviously, on the social platforms, but we're also experts at influencer, with influencers and helping them to also tell their story and get that, that narrative across, across the various channels. And then the second bit is the who. So who you're working with, making sure that the auditing is hugely accurate, that you know exactly who you're profiling and who you're talking to. If you're an American business and the following is predominantly in the UK, that isn't the right influencer. And it sounds so tiny and so minor, but that is still happening all day, every day. And then we would manage that campaign from end to end. So we would do all of the influencer outreach, storytelling, concept, concepting, uh, production of all of the content. And then we would obviously manage the influencers, do the negotiation and do all of the return on investment too. And what those success metrics look like are different based on each brand. If we are working with a fashion retailer, then actually we are measuring the click through, the cost per new customer, the average basket value. If we are working with a camera company and the camera is seven and a half grand, like we're looking at the share of voice, we're looking at the brand perception, the brand uplift, because you don't see a TikTok video and go and spend seven and a half thousand pounds. So it's really understanding the brief and what those success metrics look like aligned to that as well. I'm sure this varies for from influencer to influencer and campaign to campaign, but what does the actual content production look like? So we have a full studio team. And I find that when you work with the mid-level, who are probably more influencer bread and butter, they know their audiences, they have built their following because they understand the social platforms. Nine times out of 10, they're fantastic content creators on their own right. And jumping on a call or a brainstorm with some of our creatives just helps to elevate that content further than their kind of normal content they distribute. But when you're working with emerging influencers who are starting their career using our videographers, photographers, audio, motion graphic designers, they're not experts in that space yet. So we're supporting them, getting there. And then we do a lot of work with celebrities and celebrities are not celebrities because they produce their own content. They are presenters, they are musicians. And so they absolutely need to use the full studio production to make sure that that content is the same caliber and same standard that they are used to, but their audience is also used to. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some common mistakes or pitfalls that you see on either side, either on the influencer side or the brand side? The biggest pitfalls, and I feel like I stop me when you get bored because I could go on and on here, <laughs> but is working with influencers for the sake of working with influencers, not doing your due, due diligence, understanding their audience and making sure that the synergy and the alignment is there. Working with an influencer because they're following and not working with an influencer again because the demographics and the interest points marry up. Trying to be too prescriptive with an influencer usually creates a really bad partnership <laughs> because no one knows the content and the audience better than the influencers themselves. So bringing them on the journey, but also listening to them and letting them have an input on what's going to work for their audience is really important. Focusing only on the vanity metrics. So it's like, how many likes did I get to show my CMO? Like we've moved so further on from that. Yeah, I could keep going. <laughs> Amazing. Loads. Amazing. I, yeah, everything. Amazing. Incredible. Where can people find more about you? I, I peeked at your website and it's under construction. How's that process going? Well, I'm very glad to say that the team is now big enough that I'm not getting involved with a site <laughs> rebuild because that is always the bit that kills me and throws me slightly over the edge. It always takes far too much time, far more money than you anticipate. But I have a very SEO friendly name. So I am on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to find me. And then I talk about connects obviously all day long. Amazing. Amazing. And a final question for a smaller business, for an entrepreneur who's working on doing better on social media, growing their own influence, what's perhaps one action step that you would recommend that they take? If it is the business owner themselves, it obviously all depends on scale, budget, but I would really say, start building your own personal brand. Start talking on LinkedIn, creating content two times a week, three times a week, four times a week. Again, understanding your audience and let, allowing them to feel part of that journey and that narrative so that they are truly invested in the business, I think is really important. Heck yes. Amazing. Saj, enjoy your vacation. Yeah. You'll probably be on it by the time that we're publishing this, this episode. And thank you so much. I'll for still be on LinkedIn. Wisdom. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, I, I really appreciate you. appreciate you having me. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I hope you're leaving this episode with a wealth of insight and inspiration, ready to tackle your own brand building journey. If you enjoyed our conversation today and want to hear more enlightening conversations like this one, don't forget to subscribe to the Brand Gravity Show on your favorite podcast platform. And I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Leave a review or reach out on social media. Your engagement fuels my work and every comment, like, share, and subscription truly makes a difference. I can't wait to bring you more insightful conversations with industry leaders who are shaping the world of branding. Until then, I'm Kay Putnam, your psychology-driven brand strategist, signing off.